So you collected and analyzed the data. You made and shared the report. Well, now what? While many librarians conduct assessment, we sometimes have difficulty closing the loop. That is, implementing outcomes or actions informed by the assessment. Many factors can play a role here, whether it be time, energy, consensus, stakeholder interests, or available support. In today's presentation, three librarians from Sonoma State University Library will share how they developed a workshop designed for teaching faculty at their institution as a mechanism to close this assessment loop. The presenters will begin by describing an institutional survey on classroom experiences that provided the backdrop for this workshop. We'll then discuss how qualitative survey data was used as a reflection tool to engage workshop participants and provide a space to brainstorm actionable pedagogical strategies intended to improve student learning. Later in our presentation, we'll also give you a bit of a taste of the original workshop by providing you with an opportunity to review, reflect upon, and interpret some of the same student testimonials collected through this institutional survey. The presenters will also share some of the actionable solutions suggested by workshop participants in its original context. And finally, the presenters will share lessons learned from leading this workshop at our campus, including tactics for building, facilitating, and extending data-driven discussions. Our hope is that you'll come away from this presentation with an idea of how to adopt something similar at your own institution and begin to make meaning out of collected data to improve students' experiences. Hello, my name is Rita Primo, and I'm the Scholarly Communications Librarian at Sonoma State University. This is Caitlin Springmeyer, Instruction and Learning Assessment Librarian at Sonoma State University Library. Hello, I'm Catherine Fonseca, and I'm the Outreach and Inclusion Librarian at Sonoma State University. First, let us tell you a little about our institution. Founded in the 1960s, Sonoma State is located about an hour north of San Francisco. We're one of the smaller Cal State campuses and probably more residential than most. About one third of our 9,000 students live on campus. We have about 625 faculty, the vast majority of whom are lecturers. Also of note, approximately one third of our students are Pell eligible. The school is federally designated as a Hispanic serving institution. The campus has a liberal arts focus and considers itself to be a teaching based institution. SSU has a variety of mechanisms for teaching and learning development. First is our faculty center with a staff of eight not including student assistants and four faculty fellows who provide specialized support in areas such as pedagogy, universal design, and immersive training. Their work over the past five years has largely been focused on educational technology, including a migration to a new learning management system, as well as the SSU's Affordable Learning Solutions Program, part of a CSU-wide effort. The university's shared governance structure also includes a professional development subcommittee that's part of the Faculty Standards and Affairs Committee. Although they once helped coordinate professional development on campus before the establishment of the Faculty Center, the committee's main focus for the past several years has been the development of the new faculty orientation in partnership with the Faculty Center. The committee receives no regular funding to bring in speakers or sponsor awards for innovative teaching and typically routes any such request through faculty affairs to the provost. During the 2020-21 academic year, the subcommittee plans to rewrite its charge to take into account existing organizational and funding structures, to focus on an annual survey of faculty on their professional development needs, and to advocate for increased institutional support for faculty development, including that focused on teaching and learning. Additionally, departments and schools often provide their own separate professional development efforts for faculty. Providing training to faculty has traditionally been challenging at SSU to say the least. We delineate a few specific issues here. Time is always a concern for faculty who are trying to balance teaching, research, and service loads. 
This issue is particularly acute for our lecturer faculty, who make up 60% of instructors. Not all professional development opportunities on campus allow for stipends to pay them for their time to learn. Also, for a number of years, the Faculty Center has been centered on academic technology initiatives and online instructional design, such as a learning management system and accessibility audits. Finally, the campus historical focus on academic freedom and disciplinary expertise can mean that pedagogical training is devalued by faculty. The data-based workshop on inclusive learning that we created involved qualitative data obtained from a survey conducted during the spring 2017 semester put together by the SSU Faculty Center in partnership with the Campus Affordable Learning Solutions Working Group, which included me as scholarly communications librarian. The survey was created to develop a baseline of data about course materials costs and student perspectives as the working group had already collected data from the university bookstore and other campus dashboards. Much of the focus of the work involved tying financial aid needs, course failure rates, first generation status, and other metrics to course material costs. Several survey questions included an open text response that allowed students to elaborate on their responses or to address issues not mentioned in the survey questions. Staff in the faculty center conducted the data analysis and shared the results via several different mechanisms. Selected survey results were most frequently distributed via a curated affordable learning fact sheet distributed via a variety of mechanisms. All distribution of the research data was managed by the Faculty Center and largely related to the campus's affordable learning solutions program. As such, it remains unknown whether learning about these data led to changes in faculty teaching behavior, even in relation to their selection of course materials. This fact sheet included two student quotations from the open text portion of the survey. So we've given a bit of context to the original assessment tool, the Affordable Learning Survey. And as with any assessment, the survey initially enjoyed some attention on campus, with the report resulting in some press, incentive grants for faculty, and faculty showcases. But as is often the case in the assessment cycle, faculty buy-in eventually fizzles, and the assessment data is buried in the department's web page. And that makes sense. Writing and making available a report will only take you so far. Oftentimes, traditional assessment reporting stops short of facilitating the very thing that the assessment cycle has been designed to achieve, that is to say, improving student learning. After all, how many people are really going to be able to read a report and engage with it in a meaningful, action-driven way? This stagnant phase of the assessment cycle is the place to be innovative in engaging people with assessment results. It's important to move beyond the one-sided communication model of sharing a report and actually begin to have conversations with as many stakeholders as possible across the campus community about what they see, what they think, and how we can take the next steps to utilize the data. More people are exposed to the data than would have been if it were presented exclusively as a report available online. So what does this innovative action-oriented sharing of data look like? Well, in fall 2019, two years after the Affordable Learning Survey, three librarians at SSU came together to brainstorm a workshop series that would serve to inject momentum into stagnated assessment data. In the absence of substantial opportunities on campus for teaching and learning, we three librarians saw a programmatic gap on campus for providing teaching faculty with professional development resources to improve their instruction. In particular, we wanted to focus on creating a space to discuss teaching practices that touch on issues of equity, inclusion, and social justice, issues that we ourselves increasingly consider and confront when reflecting on our own teaching and effectiveness as librarians. In particular, in particular, we were inspired by topics in critical librarianship, Yvette Chavez's work on decolonizing the syllabus, and Matthew Cheney's cruelty-free syllabus meant to erase punitive measures in the classroom, all of which we'll link to in our last slide. 
Inspired by these efforts, we launched the Inclusive Teaching Workshop Series in fall 2019, a workshop series offering instructional faculty, including lecturers, a space to reflect upon and engage in dialogue regarding the implicit values and assumptions embedded in everyday classroom and course design decisions. In each workshop, participants would deeply reflect on student survey responses around a particular issue and share insights on classroom strategies for enhancing access, inclusion, and equity. With the inclusive teaching series, we felt that the library could not only fill this programmatic gap on campus, but also leverage this opportunity to translate our work as librarians to instructional faculty. Since we often find there's a sort of divide between what we do in the library and what instructors do in the classroom. With the workshop, not only could we breach this divide between library faculty and course integrated faculty, but we could use this as an opportunity to share about library related trends and issues, particularly in the scholarly communications and critical librarianship realm. In this way, the inclusive teaching series also allowed us to mark the library as a pedagogical ally for instructors and really a resource for them in their teaching. The workshop also allowed us to situate the library within broader equity, diversity, and inclusion conversations happening on campus. Since this EDI work is already so integral to our service mission and what we do on the day-to-day -day in the library. So we had this kernel of an idea. The library would host a workshop series using assessment data to drive dialogue around teaching practices. As with any programming effort, there were vital steps needed to ensure the workshop success. The first step was to get our hands on the assessment data itself. We knew that the first installation of the inclusive teaching series would utilize the data from the affordable learning survey particularly relying on the qualitative student responses from the open text portion of the survey, which had largely been ignored in the initial fact sheet summary issued by the Faculty Center. Rita, our scholarly communications librarian, already had some familiarity with the data set and knew about this hidden treasure trove of student thoughts about textbook and course affordability. So we started off by reaching out to the Faculty Center, letting them know about our workshop series pilot and inquiring about the possibility of using the anonymized open text responses received through the survey. Since the data originated from the Faculty Center's assessment efforts, we also floated the idea that the Faculty Center could co-sponsor the event and could have as much or as little involvement as they wanted. The Faculty Center was more than gracious. They sent us the survey responses and offered to provide sponsorship in the way of supplying catered lunch, as well as cross-promoting the event in their own communication channels. As we mentioned in the past slides, although teaching and learning development is a part of our campus's Faculty Center mission, their technology priorities and limited staff prevented them from providing this type of training through their own workshop lineup. By seeing this campus need, stepping into this role and inviting co-sponsorship from a campus entity whose mission aligns with the workshop's goals, the library was able to leverage needed resources from the Faculty Center while also allowing the Faculty Center to capitalize on our programming efforts and cite our participant headcount in their own programming efforts. Essentially, we sought out a mutually benefiting arrangement where the library provided the labor of planning, hosting, and facilitating the workshop, while the Faculty Center provided some of the necessary resources, such as catering and cross-promotion. With a co-sponsor in hand, getting administrative buy-in from our library dean was fairly easy, especially as the workshop would be at no cost to the library. Moreover, we framed the workshop in a way that spoke to administrative priorities, namely that we were filling a campus need for teaching and learning, highlighting library issues and resources, and incorporating an equity and inclusion lens in the framing of the workshop. The next step in building a workshop series was the promotional aspect. After all, what's a workshop without participants, right? So we had to get the word out, and we did this in a number of ways. 
We created a flyer, which I've actually shown here on the slide. And as you see from the image, rather than just calling our workshop uh, an affordable learning workshop, we really tried to repackage this concept in a way that was familiar to instructional faculty and spoke to the everyday classroom challenges that they might face. So we named our workshop The Subtle Art of Getting Students to Read, which I think is a catchier and more contextualized version of what affordable learning solutions actually looks like. We used the flyer to promote the event through the library's social media channels, adapted it for digital signage across campus, had our co-sponsor include the event in their monthly newsletter, and had all librarians send targeted emails to their liaison department heads, encouraging them to share with the rest of their departmental instructors. By far the most effective method for getting registrants to sign up was the emails sent by liaison librarians which I credit to the strength of our library liaison program and the personal relationships librarians have with faculty across campus. We set up a mechanism for registration um, and first we relied on the faculty center to oversee registration and they actually use Google Forms. Eventually though, the library took over registration for the event and we use LibCal. Uh, which I would actually recommend just for the fact that there is this built-in function for setting up reminder and follow-up emails to all those um, workshop uh, registrants, which actually made it really easy to manage the registration lists. And the final step in the pre-workshop phase was to actually begin to create the reflection tool that would be used to facilitate group dialogue in the workshop. So we combed through the data set of student um, open text responses uh, and we selected the most emblematic testimonials in order to give participants an idea of the wide gamut of feelings students had about the challenges they face when it comes to required readings. And then we ended up coding this curated set of testimonials for themes and breaking them up and organizing them by theme. And with that, we were ready to host our first workshop. During the workshop itself, there are some considerations and recommendations we use to engage participants and maximize our time together. Our workshop was just 60 minutes during the noon hour on a Friday and took place in a library classroom. We kicked off the workshop by first introducing ourselves, providing some of the context and broader quantitative findings of the affordable learning survey, and then going around the room for round robin introductions, since we had faculty members from across disciplines. We had set up the room to be in table pods with about four to five seats and each librarian was assigned to a different table to act as a sort of moderator to either start off conversation or pivot conversation when there was a lull. For the most part though, librarians were often active in conversation themselves, contributing their own experiences. So this moderator role was really informal and there wasn't much need for librarians to prompt conversation once folks started chatting. Librarians did take down notes of topics and solutions suggested. So after participants had settled into their groups and we made round robin introductions, the librarians each brought to their table a set of theme testimonials. So one table had student survey responses that were maybe around the theme of considering student needs holistically, while another table had a separate set of testimonials maybe addressing the theme of course design. Because we wanted the workshop to be dialogue driven, we were really intentional about lending the workshop a low to no tech vibe. So we didn't have any PowerPoint presentation. We didn't use any screens to project survey responses. Rather, we simply printed out survey responses on pieces of paper and handed them out to workshop participants. So we gave workshop participants about five minutes to read through their group's theme set of testimonials and pass them around until the entire group had read through their full set. After that five minutes, the librarian moderator at the table asked some questions to get conversation going. Questions like, do any of these testimonials resonate in your classroom experience? Or are there any connections you can draw between what you've read in these testimonials and what you do in the classroom? After about 15 or 20 minutes, librarians wind down group conversation and then each group shared some of the highlights to the entire room. Using their notes, librarians share out on the 
groups of signed set of testimonials, some of the challenges discussed, and some of the solutions offered. We sometimes invited specific instructors to speak more fully about a specific contribution they had to the conversation. After all the group share out, we then swap out the set of testimonials between the groups and the entire process repeats as time allows. So by inviting faculty members to start the conversation by talking about their teaching experiences and practices, and then backtracking to the evidence and observations that resulted in those teaching methods, we were able through this workshop to place assessment in a familiar, inspiring, and useful context for key stakeholders. Now it's your turn. We've created an accompanying Google form with two student testimonials from our affordable learning survey. We're going to ask you to go to that Google form and read and reflect on, the res on these testimonials. Once you have reflected on those two testimonials, it should only take you maybe about five minutes or so, come back to this presentation and see how Sonoma State faculty responded to these testimonials. When in the workshop we talked about the costs of textbooks, faculty suggested a number of different solutions to help students pay for things that they needed and also to be able to access the textbooks. Some of those suggestions are listed here. Um, commonly, we had faculty suggest uh, putting copies of their books on reserve in the library so all students in the class had access to required reading. Uh, we also, as librarians in the workshop, suggested that the faculty reach out to their subject librarians to um, help them find affordable options for their students. Additionally, faculty suggested accepting alternative editions of textbooks that students could buy because usually uh, older editions of textbooks tend to be much cheaper than the newest edition. Um, an, in, an innovative practice, at least from one faculty member in a specific department, is a loaning library they have established where um, students who have taken the class and would like to take an A class and would like to donate their books that they purchased for that class to future students, they can do so and the department maintains a library for them. Additionally, we had conversations about how faculty could move away from textbooks altogether uh, through a variety of means, either creating course readers um, by choosing selected passages in required readings and developing a reader that would be much cheaper in cost than a full textbook. Um, we've also, we also discussed how electronic library collections can supplement readings or can replace readings altogether by sharing links to articles, um, electronic books, and other types of materials from the library in their learning management system, which we use as Canvas here on this campus. And finally, we had a brief discussion about open educational resources. There are some faculty who have adopted open educational resources, such as um, textbooks that are freely available online in their classes. With that discussion, there is always a conversation about the difficulty about finding a text that is suitable and selecting that text. So um, we had an, a discussion about how the choice to move to OER can um, be one that takes time and needs a little bit of iteration. But overall, in the end, it is much more useful and accommodating for our students. The topic of 
getting students to read or the fact that they weren't reading in, when uh, readings were assigned was a much more popular uh, topic of conversation among our faculty, both because they wanted opportunities to um, share solutions, but also just opportunities to um, maybe vent about uh, their students' practices in the classroom. These student testimonials that we did share were very, very useful in opening up a conversation and thinking about student perceptions about required readings. And from those conversations, we came through a select a number of great solutions um, in exposing what sometimes is called the hidden curriculum of college. Uh, so one of the solutions that we had that was suggested was to um, continuously throughout the course iterate the importance of the readings so for a faculty member it would be explaining why they chose the readings um, their purpose their value and their relevance to the course you can see a slide that was shared in one of our workshops to the left which is um, something that a psychology faculty member um, shared with us and it shows how both the textbook um, materials and the class materials join together to explain the content that the students are going to be quizzed on. So really giving a visual representation of the importance of reading the textbook. There were also suggestions to make connections between the readings and the class content explicit. Um, so while the instructor is talking after a required reading day, um, to really call out the connections between what they had read and what the students were doing in class, what the students were um, being assigned, and potentially the exams that the students were going to take. Another recommendation was to, for the um, faculty to preview and promote the reading assignments in class. So before the assignment, it, the reading is actually required that evening or after class, um, faculty would help students over that hump and really recognize the importance of reading um, by letting them start reading the key piece or start start doing a little pre-reading in the class time. So sociology faculty that we had in our workshop mentioned that um, they do this and um, also they do it popcorn style so that one student would read a certain amount and then um, pop it to another student to read a certain another amount and uh, it promotes engagement with the reading in the classroom itself. Finally, we um, talked a lot about how to hold students accountable for the material that they are reading or they are being required to read. Uh, we had heard specifically from one student that they were frustrated when after hearing that their classmates didn't do a required reading. The faculty member adjusted their course content to meet the students, which meant that the student that did the work um, did extra work and was exceedingly frustrated that they had done all that reading and it amounted to nothing. Um, so we had a long conversation about how if we don't grade students on an assignment, they think that we regard it as not important. So we talked about ways to communicate to students the value of readings um, and also how to hold the students accountable. So by assigning reading related activities that are worth points um, or providing discussion questions that students are required to answer that accompany the readings, um, asking students to answer a graded questionnaire um, with something from the reading that they could have grasped or ask students to lead classroom discussions on that required reading are all suggestions that we had from our workshop. In addition to sharing some of our suggested solutions that came through in our workshop, we wanted to share some of the lessons that we learned in uh, 
trying to launch this workshop and things that worked and things that didn't work. Um, so something that worked really great for us was finding partners to um, help us both promote and create the workshop. If we hadn't partnered with the Faculty Center, we would have um, not had the level of engagement, participation, the number of participants, or uh, potentially our, even the design of our workshop would have been completely different. So the Faculty Center was a great partner for this workshop. We also learned after um, reporting on the workshop that it is very important to share and promote the workshop through multiple channels. Um, there, at our campus in particular, there's many different ways that things are communicated and there's many, um, and so we're trying to learn the best, best ways to both get what, get uh, the information out there and do it efficiently and effectively so after the fact people don't ask why they hadn't heard about it. We also learned that it is important in the workshop itself to hold space for the instructors participating to vent and um, feel as though they're being heard, maybe do a little bit of complaining about what they're experiencing in the classroom. Um, teaching can be a very isolating and a very frustrating experience, especially when you walk away from an instruction session where things just did not go well at all. So just per giving them space to really connect with each other and uh, complain helped really develop a, a bond between our participants and let them be more open in sharing um, the things that they do in the classroom to promote inclusivity. Um, so that was definitely something that we learned and we are working to build in that space uh, in our future workshops. And also, after the we're, we're uh, we learned that we need to um, create mechanisms to allow the participants to in ongoingly, continuously engage with the content and with the um, experience of the workshop. So something that we did as a first pass was create a a, a Google Doc that compiled all of our suggested solutions together and we sent that out to the participants. Um, but we're also kind of searching for ways to continue to create that community so the workshop doesn't feel like it's a one hour let us talk about solutions and never implement them. Overall, we found this workshop to be a really fantastic and productive way to engage instructors in the qualitative data that had been collected through the survey that otherwise wasn't really being heard super well. Um, so we're hoping to build on that success in that workshop and we're thinking about ways to do that in the future. And one of the things we've been thinking about is to build new partnerships with additional campus entities to think of new topics um, that live in this realm of inclusive teaching and expand the conversation. So we've been talking, we, we were able to launch an additional workshop um, talking about non-traditional students um, when we had get, got some qualitative data from our Transfer and Transitions Center on campus. Um, we're also looking to potentially partner with um, other, what we call our student services entities on campus. So thinking about our disability services for students um, or financial um, aid services, our health center, these other um, support services that students might go to that faculty might not be as connected with. 
We also are trying to um, think about ways to grow a community of inclusive teachers. So as I mentioned in our last slide, we're trying to think about mechanisms to follow up on the conversation that happens in this workshop through Google Docs. Um, we also might think about creating meetups that follow up on the workshop to see what has been implemented, what potentially has been um, what was helpful, what was not helpful, um, additional ways to continue that conversation. Uh, we haven't thought about any great ideas yet. It's, it's still a little bit in the works. And finally, we're um, potentially hoping to find ways to uh, deliver this workshop virtually. Uh, we have done, we have been able to uh, pass this to do this workshop successfully a couple different times with different uh, participants and we're hoping to continue to be able to do it um, but given the current stasis of higher education um, in pandemic times and especially considering that the California State University system will be virtual in the fall. Uh, we are actively trying to figure out how we can create this beautiful synchronous um, workshop in a virtual environment and still maintain the same levels of engagement and participation.